Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Harmony. For those of you here and for those of you watching online, it's good to have you with us today as we uh, celebrate in worship together. Uh, a few announcements for you as we begin the service today. First of all, this is CBOQ Sunday. What is CBOQ Sunday? It's a day that we remember that we're part of a denomination. Uh, Canadian Baptist of Ontario, Quebec, uh, that we freely associate with about 350 other churches across our province and the province of Quebec. And uh, today we celebrate that fact. So I'll be praying uh, for our denomination a little bit later in the service. But I also want to mention to you that um, in, the, in the auspices of CDOQ, they're holding a Youth Leaders Forum this week in Niagara Falls. And our pastor Sergio is going to be there until Thursday at noon. And so keep him in your prayers this week as he uh, interacts with other youth pastors from across our denomination. And, uh, and just be with uh, all that happens there and some great insights that he might get from that time away. We're looking for volunteers to make coffee after church. So first time since COVID, today we've got a couple of tables set up, we've got coffee and cookies in the gym. No cookies. <laughs> so don't even bother going, no cookies. We've got coffee in the gym today. Kids, I'm sorry, there's no cookies. Uh, but come into the gym after the service, a chance just to fellowship a little bit together and catch up on, uh, on how things are going and exchange your views on the, you know, how bad the maple leaves have started the season, all that kind of stuff. Come on into the uh, gym right after the service. And then, if that is well received, we'd love to have some help doing it in future weeks. Thank you ladies for doing it today, but uh, we don't want to put this on just one person. Who should they speak to if they're willing to help? Gloria? Gloria or, or Barb, okay, if you're willing to help make coffee once uh, on Sunday. And then also, since we're talking about volunteering, Sergio's looking for some volunteers to help on uh, the nights of October 27th and 28th, uh, preparing for and helping to run uh, a fall fair that, that is done here. Um, it's open to the whole church, but he's looking for people to kind of help him pull that off. And perhaps even more importantly, he's looking for donations of candy. Uh, that can be given as prizes at the different booths at this kind of carnival that, that goes on. And so what he's hoping is as you go shopping for your Halloween candy to, to give out to children in your neighborhood, that they'll put one bag in the cart for you and one for the church and then one to give out to others. It's important to keep a bag of candy for yourselves at home. That's, that's how I do it anyway. But please, uh, it, this event depends on us having uh, boatloads of candy to give away to children so they they uh, are just blessed beyond belief by what they receive when they come and play the games here and then finally um, just to mention to you that we just got some really good news this week is it good news Patty? <laughs> we're not sure <laughs> we just found out that um, the the animal farm that we use for doing our drive-through uh, would love to come back this year and uh, and are willing to lend us their animals again which means we can go ahead with our christmas nativity drive through on december 9th and 10th put that on your calendar you're not going to want to miss it but it also means we all need to pitch in to pull this off it's one of those things like we're excited to do it but it's like this is a lot of work and if you remember last year the wind that came through uh, and kind of made a mess of things yeah. We're going to try again. Our community needs it, deserves it, and we'll be blessed by it. And so we'd love to have your help with that. Uh, come and, and talk to me or talk to the office or talk to some of the other uh, folks around your deacon and say, hey, I've been willing to help. What can I do? How can I pitch in? And together we can make that happen on December 9 and 10. Right now I'm going to turn over to our worship team. Um, Val sends her apologies. She was supposed to be leading us in worship today. Uh, but she's really sick and has been uh, for some time. And so, Patty, thank you so much for being willing to step in and, uh, and lead us today. Thank you for joining us. Our call to worship. Welcome to worship. At this turn of the season, as the temperatures dip, we gather in the warmth of God's presence. As the darkness grows, we see God's light. As the earth rests from its labors, we long for God's peace. Come, let us worship the Lord. Please stand and worship with us as you are able.
So children and youth, can we for class? It is my pleasure as your executive minister for Canadian Baptists of Ontario Quebec to celebrate CBOQ Sunday with you, our family of churches. CBOQ's mission is to equip churches and leaders as you engage in your mission from God in your community. Over the last few years, our staff and our board have supported churches through prayer, online programs, grants, and resources for ministries. Our pastors, your pastors, have been working tirelessly as well, pivoting to ever-changing rules and needs. Please continue to express your gratitude and care for your pastors during October's Pastors Appreciation Month. Over the past few years, we've missed seeing and visiting with you in person, and we were grateful to be able to gather in person at our last assembly in June, where God challenged us to be renewed, to see him making the way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, to show hospitality and welcome to each other, the stranger, and the Holy Spirit. CBOQ Sunday is a perfect reminder for all of us to be actively engaged in doing His work to care for the vulnerable and marginalized around us. It's the best time to practice the teachings in 1 John 4, 7, which says, Let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Many people need help. 
The pandemic took a toll on them and all of us. The economy is also affecting us, and many times we do not know where to turn. Now is the time to show them God's love, care, and hope. At CBOQ, it is our joy and privilege to serve you and support you in your mission within your local church and your community. We want to express our gratitude to you, and we look forward to walking with you as we live out the joy, hope, peace, and love of Christ. That was Tim McCoy, our executive minister. Tim has actually just let the denomination know that he'll be retiring, stepping down from his role as executive director of our denomination. And so um, we can be in prayer as the selection process begins to, uh, to select a new uh, leader for our denomination. Um, at this time, we're going to spend some time praying for our denomination, but also for each other. And uh, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly enjoyed the anthems that we sang this morning um, that just reminded me that God is in control and that I'm secure because Jesus is in charge. He's taking care of everything. And uh, what Tim was saying right here, you know, the, the economy is a little out of control. Interest rates going up. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And we don't have to be afraid because God loves us. And he's taking care of us. He's in control. And so we can continue to be generous in our support of the church. We can continue to be generous in the support of our neighbors and friends in our community. And we can continue to have hope and courage in times of peril because God is with us. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our denominational leaders, those who serve us and uh, seek to uh, increase and, and maximize the impact of our churches across uh, Ontario and Quebec. And God, we think today on CBQ's Sunday of our sister churches scattered all over these two provinces, 350 or more of them, as, uh, as they meet together to worship today in small congregations, in larger congregations, in congregations uh, that are in, find themselves in, in rural settings, in congregations that are downtown in the, in the core of cities, in congregations that have just been planted and are, are beginning to grow, and on congregations who are in the dwindling uh, twilight of their life as a church. God, for your church all across these two provinces, we pray that there be a sense of hope and vitality and well-being. We pray that there be an outward focus, a missional uh, commitment, that the church would know that our mission is not over, that we are not, um, we're not in a, in a convalescent home, just hanging on until you come back, but rather that our mission continues, that we have work to do, that there are things that need to be done, and we're ready to do it. And so God, enable us to accompany you on a journey that wherever you will take us over this next year as a, as a gathering of churches. And may we continue to have an impact for your kingdom. Lord, we think of all those who are, have really been battling illness lately of one form or another. We think of those who, uh, within our congregation, that are, are fighting cancer. Uh, we also think of those who are, are fighting uh, perhaps just a common cold. Lord, for all of those who aren't feeling well today, we just would lift them before you. We pray that you would place within their hearts the knowledge that we love them, that we care for them, that they're not alone. And God, we pray that your healing touch would be upon their bodies. Lord, for those who um, are, have come today with uh, an aching heart or with uh, some, some pressing crises in their life, who are just coming up for, um, they're not even sure what, but they just know they need something. They need to hear from you today. God, meet them now in this time of worship, in our hour together, draw near to each one of us, and let us leave this place transformed by spending time together in your presence today. Be with me now as I open your word. Help me to faithfully explain it and, and apply it to our lives in a way that will make a real difference for each one of us. 
Lord, finally, I just want to pray for Pastor Sergio. I pray for him today as, as he leads his church uh, in Port Colburn and the ministry that they have there, the service that they're having. We pray uh, just your blessing upon it and that your truth would be proclaimed. But God, we also pray that you'd be with him as he gathers together with other youth leaders from uh, all across the province to deal with uh, issues of, of how you're working among youth today. I pray for great insight and awareness. I pray that they would encourage one another. I pray that it would lift uh, each one of their spirits. I know that many of them are, are struggling and disillusioned, many of our youth pastors, um, just by, by the challenges that have come post-COVID. And so God, be with them, and uh, let this be a time of refreshment for them as they spend time together. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're here for the first time, or the first time in a while today, uh, today you'll find uh, we are in the midst of a sermon series called The Good Life, where we're exploring uh, one of the, the best sermons ever delivered, and that was the sermon that Jesus gave that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And so we've been looking for the past few weeks at the Sermon on the Mount, and, and looking at that together, and, and, and asking ourselves, how does it apply to us today? How does it impact our lives. You ever heard of, of the, the show Family Feud? I guess we have a Canadian version of it now. I wasn't even aware of that. I don't, I don't watch it, but uh, I remember growing up, we used to watch the Family Feud where these families would come together and take these trivia quizzes and feud with each other. The name Family Feud is actually a play on the feuds that existed between families, especially uh, down in uh, the Appalachian area, I believe, of our American neighbor. But these feuds between families where you did something to my family, so now my family, uh, our honor depends on us going and making that right and, and, and seeking revenge. But then, of course, if I kill your son because you killed mine, well, now you need to come back and kill my dog. And then I have to go and kill your dog. But now I'm going to one-up you and I'm going to kill your horse. And it just went on and on. And these, these feuds actually went on for generations. Uh, it's, it's quite fascinating uh, stories, some of them, of just how these feuds went on and on and on that nobody could just bury the hatchet and let it rest. This idea of retaliation. Well, all of that is based on the law of reciprocity. <laughs> reciprocity. Um, it's actually, the idea it comes from two Latin words, lex talionis. Lex talionis is the principle that anyone who injures another shall suffer the same injury in return. You've probably heard it said this way, an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth, right? That, that, that whenever an injury has been inflicted, then an injury should be suffered in return. It was the Old Testament standard of rightness, of fairness, and of justice. It was good for society because it prevented people from the natural tendency to do more in retaliation. The, 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 the feeling you had inside if someone took something from you was to demand even more. All you have to do is look at uh, court cases in our, in our news stories today uh, when, uh, say, perhaps a uh, uh, a drunk driver uh, hits somebody and takes a life, what are the calls for? The calls are for vengeance, the calls are for justice to be done, that person should be put away forever, or that person should you know, face the death penalty. There's, there's these calls saying, what you've done to me requires that something happen to you. Well, those who kept the law of reciprocity felt they were being upright and good. They felt they were obeying the law. They would like to have done something far greater in return to pay someone back for injury, but they limited themselves to what had been prescribed as fair. But was this really the best way to live? Gandhi once said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. It's really a way of saying there is no end to this. If I seek vengeance, if I seek to make justice, well then you're going to seek it back because we all feel like our injuries are more grievous than those suffered by anyone else. 
And so Jesus steps into this with the next section of the Sermon on the Mount, one that contains some of, I think, the most challenging and demanding requirements for any of us who seek to follow Jesus as we live the good life of the kingdom. As I explored this uh, short few verses this week, I found it extremely convicting and challenging. Um, so difficult to understand and apply to my life in a way that I was ready to obey. See, as we go through this, what you think. If you're, if you're willing, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses, uh, we're going to start at verse 38. We're just going to read from verses 38 to 42 right now. We'll start there, and then we'll pick up and, and carry on a little after that. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. That's the part that comes out of the Old Testament law. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Okay, so what is this actually saying? Well, once again, Jesus is contrasting the way of the kingdom with the way of society, or the way of the world. He says in each of these things, you have heard, but I say. You've heard, but I say. And Jesus is teaching here, uh, in the good life of the kingdom, that there is a better way, there's a higher way than lex talionis. And in the short few verses that we just read, he gives four examples of what he means. He gives four examples that the people of his day would have readily understood and been able to understand what he was calling them to. Let's take a look at those. We have to be very careful as we seek to understand what he's teaching here, because unless we understand precisely what Jesus is teaching, then this passage can actually cause a fair bit of harm. People might con conclude that Jesus is teaching us to become passive victims of abuse. Someone's abusing you, just take it. Don't say anything. A closer look, however, reveals that Jesus is offering a brilliant way to respond to abuse and to attack out of a position of kingdom security. For all of us, when going through tough times, we need to remember this. We need to remember that the kingdom of God is not in trouble, and you are not in trouble because you belong to the kingdom of God. In each of the four examples, Jesus teaches the exact same thing. That in the kingdom of God, we do not need to retaliate because there's a better way. So let's look at the four examples, okay? The first example is someone attacking you or insulting you. He says, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Now, in Jesus' day, it was really common uh, for someone to slap someone else, especially a slave owner to slap their slave. Okay, so if you work for me, if I'm in a position of authority over you, if I have uh, you know, a different social standing than you, it was okay for me to slap you, to put you in your place. However, it was never okay for someone in lower social standing to slap the person above them. How many of you have ever wanted to slap your boss? That wasn't allowed, okay? But the boss was allowed to slap you. They could treat their slaves however they wanted. But you have to look very closely at the words that are being used here. It says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. Now why would it say the right cheek? Well, in Jesus' day, the left hand was never used for hitting. You never struck with the left hand. It was always the right hand. In order for the right hand to hit the other person's right cheek, how do you have to hit them? It's a backhand. So understand that what's being addressed here is not actual injury. This is not like martial arts, right? This is not taking you out kind of hitting. We're talking about an insult. We're talking about hitting you in a way of dismissing you and putting you in your place. Okay, have you ever been in a discussion with someone that's gotten a lot of hand and that person turned and was like this, right? It's, it's this backhand slap 
to the face. It doesn't cause a lot of harm, but it puts you in your place, reminds you of who you are and that you have a lower position. What does Jesus say? He says, offer the other cheek as well. If somebody wants to put you in your place, let them have at it. And I think perhaps what he's suggesting here is that it's, a, it's an attitude of nonviolent response. The natural inclination when someone hits you is to hit back. It's almost instinct. It's almost like you can't even control it. Slap, slap, right? It's just happening. And Jesus is saying, no, there's a better way. You don't have to retaliate. You don't have to litigate. Again, look in the news when we hear about lawsuits and there's suit and then what's the response? Counter suit, right? You're going to sue me? Well, I'm going to sue you. Well, then I'm going to send even more lawyers and sue you. And Jesus is saying there's a better way. You don't respond to insult that way. We can make others think twice by responding in a different way. And of course, this is not a universal law. We need to understand that Jesus, these four examples that are given here are not legalistic examples. We can't read them as black and white uh, adherence to a different kind of law. But Jesus is rather offering an alternative to people from reacting the way the people of the world would tend to react. He's saying, as my followers, you can react different. He's not saying you should ever let someone abuse you. And I need to make that so clear. Abuse is always wrong. If you're being abused, if you're being abused by a spouse, if you're being abused by an employer, if you're being abused by someone you know, you need to report that. That needs to be dealt with. And if you're not sure how to do that, come and talk to me. Abuse is never okay. However, you can be strong and respond out of your identity in Christ as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven by not responding to that attack with attack of your own, without, without taking the matter into your own hands. Okay, number two, someone suing you says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. well what's going on there? Well, in Jesus' day, people were so poor that many people literally only had the clothes on their back. That's literally the only thing they possessed. And so, if they borrowed money from a rich person, if they needed some money for some purpose, they would actually give an article of clothing to that person, their inner garment, this one-piece garment that they wore under their cloak, they would give that as kind of a surety, as kind of a uh, collateral, uh, to, to guarantee that they would pay back their debt. And if the debt wasn't repaid, that person could take them to court and uh, require that that article was forfeited, that it now belonged to the other person. Now, it sounds fair. It sounds like, well, that, that's a good way to make sure that your debt is repaid. But actually, in practice, it was quite repressive. And so Jesus offers a stunning solution. Offer your outer coat as well. Your outer coat was that second garment that they wore over the one-piece one. It provided some cover to them uh, when they had given up the other garment. Now, again, this is not, he's not telling us anyone to do that literally. If they're in court and they gave up the second piece of clothing as well, they would have been standing in court naked. Jesus isn't telling them to do that. Rather, again, he's talking about a principle, an attitude. Um, in Exodus, back in Exodus 22, there's actually a legal requirement, uh, an Old Testament law, that forbade taking someone's coat. It, it was illegal to take someone's coat. So why does Jesus then say to give it up freely? Because the guiding principle of the kingdom is the principle of love. You see, the normal reaction when someone is taking something from us against our will is to give it up grudgingly, to cling to it, to demand our rights, right? If, if, if someone, uh, is requiring something to you, say, you've got a, a, say you have a job description, uh, you know, the, the, um, you, you part of a union, and the union says, this is the letter of the law, this is what you have to do, this is the only thing your employer can, re can require of you, 
And so do the letter of this and no more. Don't, don't go over and above. That's the natural reaction. To cling to what we have. To, to, to give no more than is necessary. Why? Because I need it. I need to keep as much as I can for myself. I have to take care of myself. And therefore, if someone comes after me, I'm going to lawyer up. I'm going to litigate. I'm going to make sure that I am protecting myself. And Jesus says, those who live in the kingdom, those who live the good life, can take a different approach. Here's my shirt, and here's my coat. You're asking this of me? I'll also give this. It's an inner attitude. It's not making it a law, but rather, it's saying that we do not have to live in fear. We don't have to claim. We don't have to hold back. We don't have to retain as much as we can for ourselves because we're not in danger. Jesus is reminding us that love is the one great commandment of the kingdom. And love always asks, how can we help another? It never protects ourselves. Because we're not in a position of scarcity, we can freely give our possessions away without fear. We don't have to stand up for ourselves and say, no, I have to protect what's mine because God, <coughs> excuse me, God is taking care of us. Example three, <coughs> someone imposing on us. We read, if someone forces you to go a mile, go also a second mile. In Jesus' day, the Romans uh, borrowed from a, a, actually a Persian practice and um, required that the Roman soldiers could ask anyone they wanted, any, any of the subject people, to carry their, their armor, their, their belongings, their equipment. They could carry it, but only one mile. And the reason for this practice was because otherwise they would force them to carry it even farther. I can make you carry my stuff all day because I'm powerful, I have a sword, you do not, therefore, basically you're my slave, you'll do what I say until I let you go. And so the Romans passed a law saying, no, soldiers, we want you to treat the subjects right. You can only require one mile of service from someone. Jesus looks at his followers and he says, do the unthinkable. You see, the reason this is unthinkable is because no one wanted to carry the Roman soldiers' equipment for a mile. They hated the Romans. They were repressed by the Romans. They did it because they had to, because they were forced to, not because they wanted to. And Jesus says, hey, if they ask you to take their stuff one mile, you take it two miles. Again, he's not saying literally two miles, not only two miles. He's talking about the attitude of the heart. It's not like pitching up, picking up a hitchhiker. It's not like uh, helping your friend move. They call and they say, we know you have a truck. Would you come and help us move some stuff? It is, and you're like, sure, you know, I'll, go the, I'll go the second mile. I'll go the extra mile. I'll, you know, I'll, not only will I go over and help you move, I'll bring cookies. That's not what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying, because when we do that, we're helping someone we probably care about, right? Jesus isn't talking about someone we care about. Look at the word that's used there. It says, if anyone forces you, if anyone forces you to go one mile. Okay? So this is not willing. This is not because they want to. They're being forced to help. Why does Jesus say go the second mile? Because the principle of love seeks the good of the other person. In the kingdom, the recurrent question is, how can I help you? Which even extends, and this is the point of this Example, it extends to those who we don't like. It extends to those who are oppressing us or that are seeking to put us down, to hurt us. We can't just help those we like. We're also called to generously help those we don't even like at all. Fourth example, someone begging from us. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Again, this comes from the Old Testament. If we look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, sorry, chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted hard -hearted, or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Okay? The Jews hearing this, the, the audience that Jesus had this day as he was speaking, understood 
one dominant teaching about money, and that was you only gave it to your kinsmen. See, the, the people living around you were your tribe. They were people just like you. They were family. And so, give to them. But even with family, only give what you absolutely have to. Help them with their need, but nothing extra. According to the law, we should restrict our charity to our own community and only enough to meet what is needed. Now, everybody that was listening that day was aware of that teaching. And Jesus goes and removes the restrictions. He says, give to the one who asks you. Anyone. Not just your neighbor. Not just your family member. Not your cousin. Not your second cousin, once removed. But give to anyone who asks you. And he doesn't put a limit on the amount you do. He says, give to whomever asks you. And do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He doesn't say, but give them only what they need. Again, when people come up to you and ask for money, and we have it in our city, when people come and ask for money, or perhaps you have that neighbor that always comes looking to borrow a tool, I don't know about your experience, but in mine, those that come to borrow a tool from me seldom <laughs> return the tool. Even more so if it's a book. If you lend a book, I, I just assume that if you're borrowing a book from me, I'll never see it again. I, I, I kiss it goodbye and give it to you. Why? When people come to us, they're having to show great humility. It's not easy to ask, to beg. But giving requires great trust. It requires trust, because what I'm giving to you is precious to me. And to be honest, do you really need the money? Are you just being lazy? Are you going to use this money for something you shouldn't? Can I afford to give this person money instead of keeping it and using it for my own family's needs? Once again, Jesus isn't giving us a hard and fast law. In some situations, I believe that it's unwise for us to give money to someone who's begging for it. There's situations where we might be enabling a behavior that is not appropriate. However, Jesus is dealing with what? Not the practical, not the, not, he's not prescribing an action, he's talking about our hearts. He's talking about our heart attitude toward others. And so, once again, the kingdom principle of love is a play. I can give my money without fear because I reside in the kingdom. I can give money to someone that I'm perhaps a little suspect of the motives of because ultimately it's not, it's not up to me how they use that money. God just calls me to be a cheerful giver and to trust that he will supply all my needs. I can give to them because I love them, not because they need it. And, and I think this is so important. We sometimes gauge our donation or our investment or our, our gift to someone on how worthy they are to receive it. Jesus is saying here, it's not about how worthy the other person is. Your giving should be come from a place of your own love, from your own heart and your own attitude of generosity and abundance. I can give to you because I love you, not because you need it. It's important for us to remember that we have access to an unlimited amount of money that God will provide for us to go away. I believe this with all my heart. The reason I believe this is because for, for those who, who have never given a, a regular amount to a charity or to a church, you know, perhaps have given 
trying to be really careful with my words here, we give in, in more of an impulsive act of offering based on um, a compelling story or, or compelling need, and we give in response to that, you know, a tsunami that hits or, or, or something like that, we respond to that, we're giving to the need rather than giving out of a place of security in Christ where we're giving out of a, a, a desire to be loving, generous people in our society. The principle of tithing, the principle of faithfully uh, giving money uh, even to the church is not about the church needing that money. It's about us living with this awareness that we have unlimited money. How many of us struggle with that? We feel like, Pastor, are you kidding? I don't have two pennies to rub together by the end of the month. That kid, that's not true. But it is true. I've seen it over and over and over again that our generosity, the only bounds to that is our faith and trust in God. God will never leave us wanting. He will always take care of our needs. He loves us more than the sparrow. He loves us more than the lily. He will take care of us if we're taking care of what matters to him. So as followers of Jesus, we can do the unnatural and the unthinkable because we don't live in fear. We know that God sees and that he cares for his children. Now all four examples that Jesus gave there would have startled people it would have caused them to ask what kind of person would actually live this way. And my friends, if we live this way, it will startle people in our society as well. As far as I'm concerned, this is the kind of evangelism that you should be doing. This is the kind of evangelism that every one of us can do. Let's continue on and read. Uh, just a, a few verses more from verses 43 to 48 of Matthew 5. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus continues his sermon by teaching about loving our enemies, or loving our, our opponents, our rivals. He's confronting an understanding about the limits of love and the right to vengeance that comes right from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, loving your neighbor as yourself was the basic expectation. It was the minimum standard for the Jewish nation. It was perfectly acceptable to hate your enemies. It wasn't commanded, it was just accepted that that was going to happen. People like those terrible Romans. Those were the understandings that those listening to Jesus that day would have had. But Jesus asks for more. He asks for much more. He commands his followers to love their enemies. And what does he mean by that? Well, the Greek word translated love here is agapeo. And it refers not to a feeling, but to an action. To agapeo someone is to will the good of another. It doesn't involve uh, an emotion like the feeling of love or even liking a person. We will their good and we demonstrate it through our actions. And this is so important because loving our enemies seems impossible because we think I can never feel love for someone who is my rival or who opposes me. Jesus is ask, not asking his followers to feel love, but to act in love. Guys, I think this applies so much in our relationships, in our relationships with co-workers, perhaps most of all, in our relationships with our spouses. 
There are times maybe where we don't feel love for our partner. We don't feel love. We don't feel any kind of kinship with the person we're married to. And Jesus says, it's not about feeling. You don't do stuff for them when you feel like it or because you're feeling this emotion, this spark, this romantic longing for them. No, you do it by choice. You choose to love the other person. It's not an option. It's easy for us to love those who love us. Anyone can do that. He, he gives the illustration of a tax collector. But it's hard to love those who we know intend us harm. It's hard to love our rival. For that person that, that's, that's trying to step on our back to get ahead. For that person that's seeking the limelight that, that we feel we deserve. It's hard to love them. It's easy to pray for our family, but it's, it's hard to pray for those who oppose us. And yet it can be done. And what does this passage say? It says that when we do so, we will be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It's not talking about sinless perfection. What he's saying is that when we love like this, when we choose to love the way God loves, then we are acting after the nature of God. You see, in Romans chapter 5, we read that God loved us when we were undeserving of love. That God sent His Son for us when we were sinners, when we were, when we were flaunting, uh, you know, like just telling God, get lost, we don't care, I want nothing to do with you. When we were stomping our feet and going our own way, in that time, God sent His Son for us. He acted in love. When we love and, we're, and, and seek to bless our rivals, we are acting like Jesus. Jesus doesn't ask us to do something that he wasn't willing to do. He practiced what he preached. He was beaten and spit on, and spit on, and he was falsely accused, but he did not retaliate. He loved those who hated him, and he forgave those who executed him. Jesus is not asking us to do something that he didn't already do. He invites us to a new way of living. A way of living that transcends the normal course of actions and human emotion. And this is the good life. Outside of the kingdom, outside of a relationship with Jesus, this kind of living is not possible. My friends, every time we retaliate or seek to get even, we're operating by the narratives of the kingdom of the world. When we refuse to freely give, we demonstrate our allegiance to, a, to the world with its narratives of scarcity and fear. When we hate our rivals, we betray the God who loves his enemies and gave his son for sinners. But when we pray for and bless those who oppose us, we align ourselves with God and with his kingdom. We are living the good life just as Jesus did. As I close, if we're indwelt, by Jesus, who became poor so that we can be rich. We will be rich. No matter how little we have, we will be more than enough people. If we choose the world's way, we will be never enough people. Because our wanting will always outpace our having. And we'll never be satisfied. We are rich not because of the size of our bank accounts, but because of the size of the God who dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. Our value is immense. Our world is safe. A rich self gives because life is hidden in Christ, in the infinite, utterly generous God who is Lord of past, present, and future. And so Jesus calls us to be extraordinary, to remember our kingdom identity, I am the one in whom Christ dwells. And to practice kingdom awareness, I reside in the strong and secure kingdom of God, which is not in danger of collapsing. And with this in mind, we can live radically, generous lives, in which we actually seek to bless our rivals. Let's close with a, a response of worship.
for you to join us. Let's stand and worship. getting more Facebook likes than they are, or getting, uh, you know, uh, financially being rewarded more than they are, and, and we feel envious of that person. I want to do something a little different as we close today. I want to take a minute for silent prayer, and I want to challenge you to do this. Right now, you know the name's already in your head as soon as I said that. Pray for that person. 
pray for that person you feel doesn't really deserve what they're getting at your expense. Pray for God's blessing upon them this week. And if you don't have anyone, good for you. Pray for me <laughs> that I will be able to uh, have that attitude as I go through my life. Let's spend just a minute in prayer. God, hear our prayers and enable us to go from this place as people aware of our position in the kingdom, of our security because of the God we serve. Help us to be extraordinarily generous and kind this week. Help us to make a difference for your kingdom until you return. In Jesus' name, amen.